authoritarian leaders. And that was the beginning of what is a whole discipline in the university now, which is called social psychology. And the early part of social psychology was small groups to understand group dynamics and meetings and things like that. So what's my history, which has been a lot of fun for me, was when I got to graduate school, I realized that as an undergraduate, I was taught by a man named Hubert Bonner, and Hubert Bonner wrote the first textbook in social psychology in the United States. That is, there was no social psychology until about the 19, late 1940s. And so uh, I feel like I have been there ever since it started, practically. Uh, and that has been a lot of fun for me. So um, the... What's happened in, in the study, people in the, in the university, have, what have they studied about groups? They've studied roles, they've studied group development, they've studied leadership, they've studied meetings, all kinds of things. And if you want to improve how groups are working, you can use this knowledge. Uh, and there are kind of two streams here. Uh, the researchers produce a lot of knowledge, but the practitioners, uh, who are the people who ended up being in OD, trained by uh, national training labs in some places like that. The practitioners are the ones who use the knowledge to improve groups. So how do you do this? Well, um, the, I'd like to just take a look at uh, the slides that we have. Are there slides up now? Could we put the slide up that is called Levels of Intervention? Oh, so move forward, yep. Okay, so if you look at this, look at the, um, this slide, you'll notice that at the bottom, there are individuals. So here we are. We, we all, in all organizations, we're dealing with individuals. But it's, it's always the case that individuals individuals interact with each other and they do that in order to uh, to make things happen in the organization so we have interpersonal relations and then in order to make things happen even more effectively we have groups of people who have subgroups who form the organization and those groups have to get along with other groups so we have intergroup kinds of issues in organizations and as a result when you, when you draw a big circle around all of this, what you have is a system. A system in which you have individuals and interacting with each other in groups and groups interacting with each other, and then you have the whole system. And it, OG has what we call interventions. It's kind of a, a fancy word, but what it means is we think we know something about how to improve what is going on at each of these levels. And one of the things an OD person does is to make some choices with whoever they're working with about at what level are we going to work. So these days, I think, there's a lot of work at the system level. But uh, previously, there was a lot more work at the group level. When I was trained in the 60s, uh, we, we had a lot of, of group development, and we had a lot of team building, and we had a lot of uh, work at the uh, interpersonal level. We knew a lot about kind of how to help people at those levels. We talked a lot about systems, but we didn't have many real strategies for dealing with systems. So now I'd like to show you the OD chart, which um, is uh, more than we can really talk about here. And uh, is that up on the board now? And do people have copies of this OD chart? Yes, they have copies, and we're okay. going to see it on the screen in just a second. Okay. 
Well, if you look at the copies of the OD chart, uh, these funny little figures uh, are on this chart because my colleague Billy Alban and I, her granddaughter, drew these figures for us. But what this chart does, I just want to, I'm going to talk very generally about it. But this is kind of a summary of some of what we call interventions or ways that OD folks work in organizations. Across the top is a kind of timeline of what was going on in the world, uh, beginning with uh, World War II and going on toward the present. And across the bottom is a, a list of some of the organizations that were early adapters, people who jumped right in and started using uh, OD right away, basically. But the, from our point of view here, in this conversation, the important thing to notice is that um, we, we always, the, the ways that we work are represented by the, the four middle lines. Some of the earliest work was in survey research. That is, OD has always felt very strongly that we are data-based. So we ask people, we collect information, we don't just decide things. We work with people to know how they are thinking before we move ahead into to be uh, to to make changes. So we use a lot of surveys, we use data feedback, and we use interpersonal feedback if we're working at the uh, at that level. Then the groups that I was just talking about. Um, the National Training Labs uh, developed something called sensitivity training, but it's really group dynamics training. And uh, so there are a number, if you walk across that whole line there, you'll see team building, which was something that was very strong in the 70s and 80s. And then there were intergroup workshops where you bring two parts of the organization together to talk to each other. And Ed Shine, who you talked with last night, is very strong in the whole area of process consultation. That is, he helped people to understand how they were doing their work. And then we began to be aware of the fact that we needed to, to not just talk in one way, but we needed to understand the, the diversity of the people who worked in the organization, et cetera, et cetera. So we, as you go across here, you find all kinds of different interventions that have happened up to the present time where one of the interests is how do you work with virtual teams and finally there is the the system uh, and I think one of the things that I bring that is kind of fun is that ever since the beginning of OD we always talked about systems but the truth is we never had really any good interventions that really worked with the whole system until the large group interventions, which is over, happened over in the 90s and the 2000s, basically. So mostly we were struggling to work with the system, but we didn't really have methods. And in my second part of my talk, I will talk more about those methods, and because I think they are the things that are most popular today and that a great many OD people are using. So this is uh, just a just some of the kinds of things that OD people have been involved in. But it seemed to me and to the planners of this conference that it might be quite useful to um, do a quick history. Probably not enough, but enough is enough here. Um, of what, what is happening, what has happened uh, to, to get us to the present state. So Rick, uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, to ask the get people talking to each other about the topic that we're we're moving into here. What they would like to talk more about with me. Okay, in your uh, table groups, uh, I, I'd like you to kind of just discuss your reactions uh, to the first segment of uh, Barbara's uh, presentation. Uh, comments your own uh, perspectives or questions uh, in your table groups. So we'll do that first in the table groups. So I'll give you uh, 
few minutes, uh, and then we will ask you to actually uh, ask your questions or share your perspectives. So uh, we're giving the uh, table groups uh, some time to, to discuss and uh, share their reactions uh, before they shoot out their questions or comments. Okay, uh, Barbara, we uh, kind of, uh, you have access uh, to the questions, yes. uh, reactions mm -hmm. uh, from the groups. And uh, okay. we'd like to just pick up uh, maybe three items, three questions, uh, and get okay. your reactions and comments. Thank uh, you. First, yeah. uh, the first one is uh, kindly give an example of a large group intervention in terms of OD. Yes. Uh, I will be telling the story uh, in the second part of this uh, talk of uh, a, a school a school of education at the University of Southern California that the, the administration of the university felt was not doing its job. It was failing. And the question was, should they just close the school or could the school reinvent itself for the modern age? And we used a large group intervention uh, the faculty and the students together created a new vision of what the school should be doing and they implemented it. And they did this in a participative way with using something called future search. That would be an example of a large group intervention in, a, in an organizational setting. And I'll talk in more detail about those in the second part of my talk or the third part of my talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Second question is, uh, kindly discuss the process uh, of individual to system level analysis. Yeah, one of the, the very interesting things for a practitioner is figuring out what level do we focus on. It's often the case that the client, the person who comes to you, will tell you, we have a big problem with the, the VP of finance or something like that. And sometimes it is the person that's the problem, but just as often it's something going on in the system at the, for example, between two groups or something like that, which is the problem. So the OD person's role is to help people diagnose or understand fully the, the, what the real problem is so that you're not trying to fix a person if the process is, if the, if the real problem is that the way the system is organized, that's what happens to this person. Uh, I hope I'm being clear about this, but, but this is a very important um, part of the OD practitioner's role is to help the system figure out what should be what the real problem is rather than the symptom, which is what often is what gets talked about. Rick? Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Any Another other questions? Question? Oh, here's one. What is the future trend of OD interventions? But I understand you'll probably uh, talk about this uh, in this coming segment. Yeah, I think it, the answer, the quick answer is we're working more and more at the system level because organizations are dealing with the global kinds of changes that they have to deal with. And so in, although there are still group problems and there are interpersonal problems, most organizations are focused on how are we going to interact in the world that we're interacting in. Thank you. And uh, yes, sir. Barbara, this is Roland Livingston. Uh, Hi, Roland Livingston. How are you? I'm good. Great. I want to ask you to talk a little bit about use of self and how the uh, OD practitioner has to pay attention to what's going on in him or her as they in, engage with a system. Well, the tradition in, the, in OD has been for the practitioner to know something about themselves and to, to have done enough work on themselves 
that they in fact engage or learn to work with other people rather than intruding themselves in that setting. So the use of self is a very important part of the practice of OD. I would be very interested, although uh, as you go through this conference, um, to hear a discussion of what would that mean in Asia? How, how does that work in Asia? I'm, I could talk about it from the point of view of a Westerner, but I think that as we translate these methods and pick up methods and use them in other cultures, we have to be very careful that we don't just make assumptions that, uh, you know, we just go in and, and do it the way it's done in the West. Uh, I think that's not a good idea. So, so I think that's a, Roland, that's a, that's a really uh, good question, but hopefully you and the delegates will have more time with each other to talk more about it. Okay. Uh, I'd like to suggest we move on to, uh, to the next segment, uh, Barbara. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's do the, the, the slides on gender and OD. This, this uh, segment is going to be rather personal. And I'm hoping that you will just listen to my story and then you will have a chance to talk with each other about what your own experience has been. I'm going to talk simply about my, my experience. So can we have the first slide, the one that says the world in 1965? Yeah. Yes. Is it okay, okay yeah. good. Okay, so here's Barbara Bunker, uh, fresh out of uh, uh, early graduate school, not, not the, the graduate school that I that's in organizational, but another graduate school. And I took a job at Duke University and in student activities. I was in charge of student leadership training I was in charge of. Um, and uh, when I got to Duke University to, to do this work, all they were doing in leadership training was Robert's Rules of Order, which is how the US Congress works but it is not group dynamics. It's very structured. So I was trying to figure out what to do. And uh, I went, was sent to a tea group as part of my training. And the tea group is a, stands for tra sensitivity training group and it is about group dynamics. It's the thing that was invented in, at the national training labs. Um, and so I discovered that there are all these things that I just talked about in terms of groups that you can learn about. And I took some of that, I got trained and I took some of that back to the campus and started a whole different program in terms of leadership training. And as a result of all that, I decided to go to graduate school and I ended up at Columbia University. And I was just extremely lucky in my choice because I got very well trained theoretically by a man named Morton Deutsch, who was a student of Kurt Lewin and whose major area was conflict resolution. But uh, at the same time in the same department was Matthew Miles. And Matt Miles was doing the most, the earliest OD interventions. He was working with schools and we were research observers and we were able to watch some of the earliest organizational change interventions where they collected all kinds of data from teachers and students and parents and faculty about what they felt was going on in the schools. And then they focused on the areas where people felt improvement was important and uh, got at all of the levels of the organization participating in figuring out what improvements were really important and how to get them to happen. So that was a, my early experience at the, getting trained. Um, it's important to understand in terms of the history of OD that the earliest OD folks were university-based. They were faculty. Uh, they weren't uh, practitioners. And uh, they were also 
all mostly white men. And it was kind of NTL, which was the training, was the institution that trained people in these skills. Uh, there were not many women in graduate school, and there were not many women being trained at NTL. So let's do the second story slide, which says my story on the top. So the way that you got to do this kind of work to become a practitioner, which I was very interested in because of my Duke history, was you got to, you had to get admitted to the internship pr training program up at Bethel, Maine, which was run by NTL Institute. It was nine weeks long. And they only took about 20 people a year. And uh, they didn't take many women at all. I went in 1968, there were three women in my class, the rest of the 20 people were men. And uh, so it would be fair to say, I think, that the, the, the group dynamics, uh, the early OD establishment was pretty much a white male club. And NCL was certainly that. And we, uh, Edie Seashore and I, Edie was around from the early 50s. Um, Edie Seashore and I and Billy Alban, who is my colleague and collaborator, uh, we tried to change the system a little bit. And we had very interesting experiences. I'm going to tell you about a couple of them. Uh, one experience we had was, this is typical of what the experience that women had at that time. Um, so we're in a staff planning. We're planning uh, for a group of people that are coming in to be trained. And so we're planning the schedule. And uh, we, have got, we have worked out the design for the morning. And we're, we know everybody's going to have lunch. And then the question is, what shall we do after lunch? So I said to this group of seven or eight people, of whom there were two women and about six or seven men, I said, uh, gee, I think that after lunch, people tend to get sort of sleepy and logy. Maybe it'd be a good idea to have some kind of activity after lunch, not, not a lecture, not another talk. And uh, what happened next was somebody else made a different suggestion and somebody else made a different suggestion. And I was sitting there wondering, maybe I didn't say that right. Maybe, maybe I wasn't very clear about what I was saying. So maybe 10 minutes later, another person in the room, Bill, said, well, he said, after lunch, you know, I think people tend to get a little sleepy, maybe a little logy. He said, I think that what we need is some kind of activity. Oh, said another guy. That's a great idea. Let's talk about that. And the whole group talked about it, and they adapted an activity. And I sat there wondering why uh, what I had said wasn't discussed. So after the meeting was over, I took Edie Seashore aside. I said, Edie, did I say something? Was I not clear? Um, you know, he, this Bill said exactly what I'd said 10 minutes earlier. And nobody, I mean, it was like I had, like nothing happened. Edie laughed and she said, Barbara, she said, they don't expect women to have good ideas. So the business of not being heard because you're female was something that we all struggled with early on. And Edie and I and many other women made a deal, we made a deal with each other. And that was, we said to each other, if you propose an idea, whether I like it or not, I will follow up. If it's not, if nobody picks it up, I will follow up and say, hey, Edie just suggested this. And I think that's interesting. I think we ought to talk about it. That's all it takes to get ideas talked about rather than dropped. But that was the atmosphere in which we were trying to make ourselves felt uh, as part of, the, of that organization. And in, in 1975, uh, four of us 
were asked to come into NTL because NTL was in trouble. And what happened there was very interesting. And that is we, we discovered how badly it, it, NTL was really in debt, very deeply in debt. And what happened was that the four of us discovered how bad it was. And we decided that we would see what we could do about saving the organization. And so what we did was we went to colleagues and we talked with them about helping us to change NTL. And we got them to agree to work free for two weeks, 75 people, which was enough money uh, in terms of income to pay off the debt. And then we went to the board of directors and we said, and this was an astonishing experience. We said to the board of directors, okay, if you will resign and give us the board, we will pay off the debt. And the board, which was a group of business people who were about to close the organization, they were going to declare bankruptcy and just close the organization. They were very relieved to have somebody save them. So they said, yes, we'll do that. And so uh, the four of us took over NTL and we changed it to be a much more inclusive organization that was interested in recruiting and training women, people of color, people of all nationalities, uh, not just white men. And so uh, that, for me, that was a very, very important experience. And that theme has run through a lot of what NTL has done over the years. And it expanded from gender to diversity to sexual preference, et cetera, et cetera, as, as we all know. So it's been, uh, it's been really a wonderful kind of history. Um, so I think that the, the thing that we might want to talk about is what's happened in the OD uh, in the United States is now there are almost more, I think there are more women as OD practitioners than there are men. So there have been huge changes over the years in terms of who is doing OD and, and what their practice is like. But I think that that we have a question for you all to talk about it in terms of my story. That's my story. What's your story? So Rick, let's get that question up on the board so people can talk about it. Thank you, uh, Barbara. Uh, at this point, I uh, would like to suggest that in your table groups, uh, you discuss uh, the question, What's, what's happening in your own organization when it comes to women and uh, the participation, empowerment of women in your respective organizations? We'll give you uh, five, seven minutes, uh, and then uh, we'll open the floor. So uh, on the screen, are some of the questions uh, that you have posted. And Barbara is able to read uh, these questions. Uh, but uh, I think there are some questions on the floor. We'll take them first. Uh, Eric? Uh, yes, please come closer to the mic. Good morning, Dr. Barbara Bunker. Thank Good morning. you very much for your uh, sharing with all of us. Thank you. I am. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I am the owner of a thirty-year-old consulting firm from Mexico uh, down mm -hmm. to Argentina for the, during the last thirty years, and I have a question that has to do with gender. Uh huh. About a year and a half ago, I said I have to take a look at myself. And I learned that although women do not have that much participation in uh, organizations as men have, especially as top executives, 75% of my proposals accepted were with women. That is, as a client, as a client. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So they, and on the other hand, I would say that almost all of the projects where women participation 
was present was uh, much more efficient and effective and healthy for the organization than those where men participated. So I came to the conclusion that men do not take risk. They used to go to Pete Marwick Mitchell to press Waterhouse at the Young for Consulting, more than choosing my firm. Because of course, if anything went wrong, they'd made the right decision. But women, they took risk. And we achieved the best results in these projects, could you, I, could, I would like to learn from you too, <laughs> Dr. Barbara Bunker, about it. Yeah, I think that, you. that that's a, thank you very much. That's just a wonderful comment. I think one of the things that we need to know, one of the reasons we need women to be more active is because they bring a different thing to the, to the party. They bring different skills and different sensitivities. And so when, they, when women are really equal partners, you can have a lot of fun because men bring their background and skills and women bring their background and skills and you get a better organization. But when you have only one, uh, all women's organizations have problems. All men's organizations have problems. It really helps to have both. And we don't have enough of that in the world, I think, where you, they, men and women are on equal footing with each other. So thank you for your comment very, very much. Yeah. Great. All right. So um, just wanted to make a process observation. Uh, Barbara is a very important woman in the field of organization development, and she was way ahead of her time. She was with all white men, and she was the only woman in the room many times. And so we want to talk about gender today. We want to talk about the role of women today in organizations. And I was, I was laughing to myself because we had all men up here uh, deciding which questions to ask Barbara. And um, so I wanted to invite some women to come up to the front to personally ask Barbara some questions. Who wants to be the first brave woman? Come up here so Barbara can see you. Hello, Dr. Barbara. Thank you very much for your uh, wisdom. And my name is Stella. And uh, I know what I understand is that uh, it's my understanding is that woman and man is just like creating partnership. Okay. So uh, yes. men different quality, women, different quality in every way, in family or in organizations. We just need to create partnership. So my question to you is, as a woman, even in the family or my company or everywhere, how can we, like, uh, as an OT practitioner, like, educate men or women, like, empowering women or educating men so that we can create partnership in everywhere? Well... I'm not sure what is appropriate in your culture, but what happened in my culture was that women got together and they started educating the men that were susceptible to being educated, okay? We started with, with people we thought would be open to this, and this was very surprising. I'll tell you a quick story. I have uh, a, um, men in my culture are used to doing all the talking, so I had a colleague who went to work with a consulting firm that was doing some diversity training. And I met him, uh, not someone who lives in my town, so I was eager to see him, and we had dinner together. And uh, it was a delightful dinner. And I said, Stephen, I, really, I, I just really enjoyed this. Thank you very much as we finished the dinner. And he said, Barbara, do you know what's been going on here? And I said, Stephen, I have no idea. And he said, Barbara, I, I have kept you talking for three hours. Meaning that he didn't 
do all the talking. He asked me questions. He drew me out. He got me going. And I did. I was totally unaware of this. But he was practicing this as a man because he was used to moving in and talking. And if the women didn't talk, he just assumed they didn't have any ideas. And so he was developing the skills as a man of drawing out somebody who is less talkative. We have that same kind of issue between extroverts and introverts. The extroverts are always talking because that's how they figure out what they're thinking. The introverts often are quiet and don't say the good stuff that they're thinking. So the extroverts need to develop the skill of finding out what's going on in the room if rather than taking up all of the time for talking. So I think your comments are really very interesting. There's a lot of interesting work that can be done here between men and women as we appreciate each other's skills. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for asking that question. All right, so men, ask questions, right? Is that the learning? Ask your female employees and peers um, and leaders what they're thinking and bring out that wisdom. Who else would like to ask a question, Another a woman or a man? Hi, Barbara. Hi there. Very nice to see you in person. I have your book at home. I, I bought oh, it. that's wonderful. Yeah. Large, large group book? I have your book, Large Scale Intervention. Oh, yeah. Does it look like this? The other way. Upside down. Yeah. That's the, that's the one. Yes. Thank you. Good. Yes. Barbara, I have... Um, I'm part of uh, some writers, say like this. I'm part of some writers who uh, uh, publish a book by Palgrave Macmillan uh, titled "Current Perspective on Asian Women in Leadership," and Good. I wrote a book chapter about Indonesian women in leadership. Uh -huh. From my analysis, historical and cultural analysis, I I see that the key factor that enable women to identify herself as a leader is their father. So identity as a leader is growing, is developing, first of all, in family. It is very hard to bring it up, or, or it's harder to bring it up in an organization, organizational life if when they are in family, they do not grow that. So my uh, thesis is, I don't know, uh, perhaps for Asian people, that we ask fathers to develop their daughters, fathers to believe in their daughters, yeah, so that their daughters can develop this identity as a leader. And we as a society can be benefit from that. What do you take on that? I think that's a wonderful comment and a very good idea. Thank you very much for your contribution. Anyone else? Ula, please come up to the front. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Ula. Good, good morning or good, good evening. <laughs> I have, uh, I really have one question uh, 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 closer. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Um, mm -hmm. so, so in Germany, we are talking about a quotation for women in uh, the top management level and also in the advisory boards. And uh, there is also a lot of discussion amongst women and uh, many of them against, are against this uh, because they say we want to... Uh, step up uh, on the career ladder by our own um, capabilities and show our strength uh, and uh, are good in competition. But I think uh, it is uh, important uh, to, to get an entrance in these hierarchies and whatever helps is good. What do you think? 
I think that at least in the United States, and possibly you can speak better for European countries, I think that um, number one, we are making very slow progress of getting women on boards and women in high executive levels. And one of the reasons for that is the laws in the United States about childcare and about uh, maternity leave and about vacations and things like that. Uh, in Europe, those laws are much better, but I think the stress for many women who have children, and there are many women who do have children who are working, um, is that it is very difficult to do what is expected of an executive these days in terms of time commitment and being available 24-7 and things like that and, and carry that role. And so in the U.S., what's happening is some very talented women who would be very able to get those kinds of jobs are deciding it's not worth it because there's not the support system out there that allows me to have, have everything that I need to have. I'm not willing to sacrifice my kids in order to be an executive vice president. It's not true of everybody. And when people make enough money, they can do child child care and that you know pay for child care and that sort of thing but it's a very much more complicated system for many women it's also the case that some men in the united states are taking on some of the family roles in order to allow women to do some of these things if that's what they want to but that's also a slow process it's not happening in every family so i think i think that's the, that is really a major issue we need more women at the top because to change the culture of a lot of organizations, we need women interacting in the executive suite with men in the executive suite to make the culture the kind of culture that women can you know, productively be part of. So it's a slow process, but that's, that's the, those are my first thoughts in, thought, in answer to your thoughts. What do you think, Ula? I think we we have a similar situation in, in Germany um, that uh, we found out after the team uh, team leader level uh, you do not find uh, chances for part time employment. So if mm -hmm. women um, have to care for children, uh, they often have to to choose: do I have a career or do I have children or have a family? And, yeah, uh, it's not a it's not a choice that women should have to make. Hmm. So they ought I to be guess. able to do both if that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, thank you, Ula. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, uh, Ula. Thank you, uh, Barbara. At this point, uh, we'd like to take a fifteen-minute break. And uh, we'll invite Barbara again uh, for the second segment of her talk. I just have a couple of announcements before we head out. Um, first is around connecting to each other and building community. And so that's something that's uh, foundational in the field of organization development is to build relationships. So we encourage you to uh, meet with three people, new people over the break, and get to know them where they work, um, and just meet someone new. The other thing that I'd like to announce is the Binus University is offering one scholarship. That's a very, that's a big deal. One uh, scholarship for a potential student. And the deadline to submit for that is going to be at noon. So over the break, if you could please uh, fill out the register, there's a form in your welcome packet and return it to the uh, Venus booth. Worth 160 million rupiah. Yeah, that's an awesome, awesome opportunity. Um, lastly, um, as we evolve into the future, uh, you have all heard of Twitter, right? Twitter? Tweeting? Millennials out there? Um, we'd like to create a hashtag, AODN2017. So if you hear something interesting and you want to tweet about it, make sure you hashtag AODN2017.
Okay? Great. See you in 15 minutes. All right. Do we have everybody back in the room? I think we have as many people as we'll get. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I just wanted to do a quick pause and get everyone's attention because I, I recognize um, there's a lot of context involved in the field of OD and especially um, the, knowing the history and the application and when it is helpful and useful to organizations. So I'm just going to slow us down just for a second and bring everybody up to speed on um, what the definition, what a definition of organization development is. Um, it's a body of knowledge and practice that enhances organizational performance and individual development by increasing alignment around, among the various systems, uh, inclusive methodologies that help with, so from a, a business, right? You guys are business people. Strategic planning, organization design, so structure, roles, process, change management, leadership development, coaching, diversity, performance management. It's a lot of stuff, right? All of these fields interact with organization development. And it is important, um, organization development is important for organizations because it helps you change and be more effective. It helps you with your effectiveness and helps you transform. Um, what Barbara, Barbara's gift to this field has been large group interventions. So large group interventions help an organization change faster. So remember when I talked about whole system transformation on day one? That is a large group intervention methodology where you engage the entire organization in transforming to be more effective. So um, she's going to talk a little bit about some case studies and examples for you, right? Given, given the business lens that you bring, um, some of her experience working in large organizations in her, in her life. Um, before we do that, the other thing I just wanted to touch on is women. Why are we talking about women? You're like, my company's fine. We have uh, a lot of women in leadership positions. Why do we need to talk about women? We're talking about women because um, we're talking diversity. Diversity, there's research that's been shown that the more diverse teams that you have, you have better collaboration, you have better innovation, better decision making, and better results. Our design team that planned this session were from India, uh, Indonesia, the Philippines, Germany, the United States. We have men, we have women. So the more diverse a team you have, the better you're going to do on your business results. You're going to make more informed decisions. So for the people in Asia, encouraging women to speak up and to be a part of the team and to contribute is going to give you more innovation and more results. All right, and everyone, we're all at different uh, levels and phases of this in our cultures and in our organizations, but it's important to continue to talk about this, right? The world is changing, and it's changing really fast, and you don't want to get left behind, right? You want to be competitive. You want to get market share. You want to be leading. You want to grow and be the fourth largest economy in 2050. That's huge, right? So that's why we're talking about diversity. And now I'm going to pass it off to Barbara, who's going to share some case studies from the business lens of how large group interventions can be applied. All right? Thanks, Aria. Um, can we have the slides for large group methods? And start with the, Good. And, and can we have the second slide on innovators? Yep, we're seeing it now. Good, okay. So a few early stories. How did all this start? Well, I think it started with uh, Marvin Weisbord, who wrote a book called Productive Workplaces and who is a well-known OD consultant. Marvin's father ran a factory 
and every once in a while, Marvin would get hauled in to try to fix problems in the factory. And he would get everybody, you know, work with a unit and it would get fixed. And then his father would say, well, you did great work and it lasted for six months and now they're just doing the same old thing again. So Marv decided after trying unsuccessfully any number of times to fix problems in the factory that what he would do is he would get the whole factory together and have them talk about why things that were decided didn't stay decided basically. And so in, a, in one of the earliest so-called large group methods, uh, Marv got them together and lo and behold, after they worked together for a couple of days on how they were solving problems at the factory, things got a lot better and they stayed a lot better. So that was, he, he wrote in his book on productive workplaces, he said, the principle here is getting the whole system in the room. That there are some kinds of organizational issues that if you don't have the whole system working on them, you can't solve them. They just keep coming back again and again and again. So that's one early kind of thing. Uh, Kathy Dana Miller, who was trained by Ronald Lippett, who worked with Lewin, um, was a very well-known consultant and she worked a lot at Ford Motor Company, uh, doing essentially training primarily of their managers. And so the Ford Company came to her, she lived in Michigan, and they said, Kathy, they said, we would like to ask you to work with 500 of our managers. We think our managers are not proactive enough. They're not doing enough. They're not innovating enough. We want them to behave differently. And so we would like to offer you the, the very lucrative contract of you know training groups of these managers to, to behave differently. And Kathy looked at them and she said, I can't do that. And they were astonished because this was a lot of money, a lot of days of consulting. And, and they looked at her and they said, why? And she said, because it won't work. You can't train managers to be more proactive. It's a problem in the whole system. So they said, they just threw up their hands and they said, okay, they said, Kathy, what would you do? And Kathy said, I don't know. But give me a week and I'll make you a proposal. So she went away and she thought about what to do. And she came back to Ford and she said, okay, she said, I think we can really change these managers, but you need, I need to have 500 of them at one time in one ballroom for one week. And that's the only way we can really do it. Now, what she was saying underneath all of that was, unless you change the whole culture, you won't change individuals. That culture change is a part of individual change, particularly if you want managers to behave differently. And Ford took a big risk and they gave her 500 managers. And after that, after they went home, there were follow-up meetings and things like that. Things began to change at Ford. It was very successful. And the managers began to take more um, initiative and do things differently. And that was because they spent time together talking about what the organization was like and where it was failing and what needed to happen to move it forward. And they made some agreements about what they would do when they left that ballroom that they then checked on eventually and, you know, uh, followed up with and kept going. So that, that's a, that also happened. And then I won't talk in detail about it, but Harrison Owen invented a very uh, loosely structured method that does a similar kind of thing. It gets all of the participants in whatever it is in one place in a room in a big circle, and they have to figure out how to work on the problem. So what happened to Billy and I was that 
we were working together on a whole different project. And we have heard about Kathy's work. And we began talking about Marv's ideas. And then we began talking about what Harrison was doing. And we looked at each other and we said, you know, this feels like a whole new level of interventions. It feels different from what we have been doing because most of us were doing team building. We were consulting to executive teams, helping them do strategic planning, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, we said, wow, this is really different. And then we also looked at each other and this is a sort of, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard about the bubble up theory, but there are people who think that when things begin to change, they don't just change in one place. They may change in several places around the world at the same time. So that it is interesting to us that the group dynamics movement developed in, in, the, in the West, in the United States, as a result of the Second World War, et cetera, and, and Lewin and stuff. But at the same time, over in England, uh, Wilfred Bion was treating a returned shock shell veterans and he invented group therapy and and he got all involved in group dynamics. So you had two or three places in the world where all of a sudden there were people were studying groups that never studied them before. And this with we looked at each other, we said, is it possible that that's what's going on here? We have a new sort of something that's bubbling up in the world, these large group things, and maybe there's more of them out there. So we didn't know. We had no way of knowing. And I was just lucky. A friend of mine, a colleague of mine, had asked me whether I would edit a special journal of the Journal of Applied Behavioral Sciences. And I had said back to him, well, I'll think about it. But the truth was, I didn't have any particularly good ideas about what the theme of the journal would be if I edited it. You know, it was like a special issue. So it suddenly occurred to me, you know, one of the ways to find out if there's more things going on is what we call in academia issue a call for papers. That is to say you announce that you're going to do this special issue and you invite people to write articles. And so I went to my colleague who was the editor of the journal and I said, look, we have an idea, but we don't know whether it'll work or not. And so what will happen? I mean, he liked the idea, but I said, what will happen if nobody submits anything and we're wrong? This, 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 this isn't just happening in a lot of different places. And he said, don't worry about that. He said, I have a lot of already to publish small group research papers. So we can have, a, if, if you don't have enough for a whole journal, uh, I will call it uh, large group and small group uh, research. And you will do the front of the journal and I'll fill from the back basically so we won't have any problem so I was quite relieved you know and uh, so then we waited to see who we could find and we started talking to people and asking people and for heaven's sake we had more articles we didn't need any of his journals uh, articles we had more articles that, about things that people were doing that was bringing the whole system together to solve problems or to plan the future or whatever they were up to. And so that, that was the, the kickoff for the large group methods book that we did together. So I know you want to know more about kind of what types of things uh, do we do. And so in the, in the book that I held up a moment ago, we divided the case studies. It's a book full of case studies we divided the case studies into the types of organizational challenges that these methods help you deal with. So I'm just going to talk about three or four very briefly uh, to give you a feeling for what they're like. Uh, if you really want to know a lot of detail, there are several books, including mine, uh, which have detailed case studies that will help you understand better. But the first one, uh, it, um, and this is on the next slide, large group examples of organizational challenges. The first one is the case of the BBC, which is, as you know, the broadcasting, the national broadcasting company in the UK. It's a huge organization and it's controlled by the government. 
it has uh, reporters and, and all over the world, so it isn't just in England, but it is very spread out. And it had been through a whole series of uh, revisions and, and structural changes and that sort of thing. And that it was a very uh, spread out organization. And so they decided that they wanted to have one BBC and that it needed to be more creative, that it's lost, it had lost its creative oomph. So what they did was, uh, Mayon Cheng Judge did the, was the consultant. And the story in the, that is written in detail is about a two-year project where they used a pre, the Appreciative Inquiry Summit, which is one of these methods, to get people to think creatively about what was going on in this organization and what needed to change in order for it to be more creative and more on the forefront, et cetera. And it was a slow process because there were, there were roadblocks from time to time, but it ended up uh, that they invented a whole new way of being one BBC uh, and they also uh, changed some structures and changed the incentive system and did a number of different things that helped them move the organization into a more flexible and a more creative uh, organization. The second case is about, I've mentioned earlier, is about the University of Southern California uh, School of Education. Uh, lots of, not just colleges, but lots of organizations have are either are facing a situation where what they're doing is no longer particularly wanted and they don't know what to do next. And so what needs to happen is some kind of strategic planning and scanning the environment to figure out how to be effective. And the future search, which Marv Weisberg created with Sandra Janoff, was the tool here. But I should say one thing about this, this uh, situation, and that is that there was huge resistance. A lot of the faculty did not want to do anything differently. Uh, and so partly, part of the issue here was to create a, a, a situation where people found resources inside themselves to want to change and want a different future. And uh, the future search is kind of an emotional a roller coaster, as Mark talks about it, but what it does is to help people really look at what's going on in the world and face the reality of what is happening to them, which most people don't want to face, and then say, okay, there are ways that we can we can move into the future, and so how are we going to do that? And it's a very creative and fun kind of process. I did one with a school of management in uh, Buffalo, and they created a whole new sort of set of curriculum and 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 uh, uh, set of new relationships with the businesses downtown and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a planning process. It's, like, it is a, it's a group level strategic planning process that's very participative. And uh, so that's the USC case. Now, American Airlines was also having a crisis they were facing bankruptcy. This was at a time when, when oil prices were going up and uh, uh, customer participation was going down. And so they used large group methods. They used a method to get each of the participating groups, which would be the pilots, the flight attendants, the people on the ramps, the people who were selling tickets, et cetera, et cetera, to to sort of present the situation that American was in and to say, how can you contribute to our not going bankrupt? Okay, thank you. So the, a similar kind of situation happened with the Federal Aviation Association. Uh, airplanes over the United States, there was a situation a few years ago where it looked like the delays on airplanes would be so severe because there were so many airplanes in the sky and not enough gates at the various airports. And so uh, Marv, Jan, Marv and uh, Sandra, in terms of uh, future search, brought together uh, all, all the stakeholders 
uh, and they had them, uh, they taught, they created a, a format for them to talk to each other about the situation. And, and they managed to create a plan, even though it was a very contentious and difficult situation that actually the next summer did not have gridlock. So it was a huge success. It didn't solve all the problems, but it temporarily uh, got them through a crisis that would have really caused a lot of upset and delay and loss of revenue in the United States. And finally, um, the Boeing company, this is interesting, which has done a lot of work with these large group interventions, uh, did something quite different after they had a big strike of engineers. And the engineers, of course, are professional people. And so these engineers are, don't usually go on strike. That is typical, uh, much more sort of laborers, etc. cetera. So it, but Boeing was very, the, the engineering group was very depressed. They did not feel that their skills were being well used by the company, and they didn't feel good about what was happening at Boeing. And so the folks that worked with them created a way of, um, said to them, there are some parameters. You, you need to create new patterns for working, ones that will satisfy you as engineers. And we will, we'll be open to that. So, but we're not gonna tell you what to do. You're gonna have to figure it out. So what that meant was that they, um, they looked at um, why the, the principles, they, they taught them principles, widening the circle of engagement. So that means talking to more people, not just the usual people that you talk to, and creating a community for action. So figuring out what it is you want to do and embracing a democratic mindset. So they taught them some principles and then each, each unit did what they felt they wanted to do, and they had some amazingly fun and interesting and very productive products as a result of, of all of this. So this is just a small sample of the kind of uh, activities that go on using these methods. But let's close my talk before you talk with the core principles, which is the last slide. And this, I think, is something to be really thought about carefully, especially in terms of its translation to other cultures. Stakeholder inclusion. You never do a large group intervention unless you have a steering committee that represents all the people who may be involved, basically. So you include all levels of the organization or all the appropriate levels of the organization. You always you never just stay with the organization. You always go outside the organization and say, what's happening in the world that's impacting us? And what is that? Where are we in terms of, of all of these kind of forces that are affecting us? Just as you're sitting here at round tables, hopefully mixed up with people that you don't know too well, all of these activities support getting to know multiple perspectives. That is, uh, and all of them support the search for common ground. In other words, there's a variety of strategies in these methods that help people figure out not what they disagree about. People are very good at figuring out what they disagree about. People are less good at figuring out what they agree on. These methods have very good strategies for helping people understand where they might agree with each other. So these are very it's very interesting methods to be considered when you're thinking about change and improvement in organizations. I'm going to stop at this point and turn this over to Ariel to see if she, do we have time for them to talk to each other, Ariel, or what's the plan here? So we're a little bit behind, so we're going to do something a little different. Um, we're going to have uh, another, a ra another summary wrap up um, from this conversation. And then we're going to go to our next uh, presenter. So unfortunately, we don't have time to talk at the tables. Um, but I just wanted to, to leave you with a couple of thoughts is um, with the, power, the power of this process is that it aligns and engages your organization in a change. So you need alignment and engagement and change adoption 
to implement a new process, a new strategy, so on and so forth, right? Um, and when you have some of these elements, you get everybody in the room, everyone in your organization in the room, when you have inclusion, you make it safe for people to, to talk. You get a shared understanding of what the problem is, and you co-create the future together. So what's so powerful about this? I changed my career because of this process. I saw how powerful it was because you get um, unleashed energy and momentum and everyone in your organization is pointing in the same direction and they've supported the change, they agree with the change and they're gonna help with the change. So I um, just wanted to wrap up. Any, any, any uh, final thoughts, Barbara, that you'd like to share with the room? Yeah, um, I think that some, sometimes it sounds like from what Ariel said that everybody has an equal voice. Everybody has participation, but when you plan these things, it's quite possible to say, uh, to, to draw a line about what the participation is going to be for. What the, so it is, it's not like you're giving the organization away to everybody in the organization. These events have focus, and there's a particular thing that people are asked to contribute to and, and asked to make decisions about. And one of the, the, the successful ones are very clear from the beginning what the role of the participants is to be. And it isn't necessarily to make all the decisions in the organization forever. Okay? Perfect. Thank you so much, Barbara. We appreciate your time and your contribution to this field as being one of the first leading women um, of, 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 of your time to really make an impact. So we are so appreciative and thank you for being with us. Thank you. I've enjoyed it.